Just give me the high sign. All right, we're live. All right, then let's get to it. Uh, this transportation committee hearing is being held during the COVID-19 emergency declaration in accordance with Ohio's open meetings law as amended by House Bill 404. This meeting is being held using the Zoom platform and is being live streamed on YouTube and on Cleveland's Channel 20. It can also be seen on the Cleveland City Council website and from Council's Facebook page. In accordance with Ohio open meeting regulations as amended by House Bill 404, notice of this committee hearing was publicly posted. This committee hearing will be conducted as all committee hearings in accordance with the council rules and Robert's rules of order. The chair will facilitate the meeting and call on persons to speak. If you wish to speak, please use the raise your hand option on Zoom. Please limit your comments to the matters before today's committee. As is the usual practice, any actions to be voted on during this committee will be done by voice vote, called and recorded by the committee clerk as requ required by rule 15. Uh, Thank you, everyone. Uh, this is I'm, I'm excited about today's transportation committee meeting. Uh, please bear with me. This is my first time uh, acting as a, a chair for a meeting, so uh, hopefully there aren't uh, too many issues. And I've been paying attention over the last year and a half, uh, give or take. Um, we have two pieces of legislation, and then a very exciting presentation by uh, the folks over at Cleveland Hopkins. Uh, prior to getting into the legislation, just a, a quick point of personal privilege. Um, I, I do wanna take another quick moment just to thank former councilwoman Cleveland uh, for uh, not only just the years of service to this body, which we've all discussed and rightly given her praise, uh, but for her leadership over the years uh, of the transportation committee, um, which you know we're all members of. So. Um, with that, let's go ahead and jump into the two pieces of legislation, um, which should not take too terribly long. The first is Ordinance 304-2021, an emergency ordinance authorizing the Director of Port Control to consent to the assignment of lease by way of concession number 56693 from Specialty Restaurants Corporation to UCG, KAGS, TGD, FAB, LLC. Ooh and authorizing the director to enter into an amendment to the assigned contract regarding certain terms. Uh, director Kennedy, thanks for being with us today. Council persons, life members of the, of the transportation committee. Um, one of the losses uh, as a effect of COVID-19 um, was the 100th Bomber Squadron restaurant on the north side of the airport on Brook Park Road. Uh, they closed their doors approximately a year ago uh, and uh, attempts to look at uh, revitalizing it from the owner's pers uh, perspective uh, did not materialize and they decided to divest themselves of their Midwest restaurants. Uh, they did an open sele selection for the 21 year uh, that remains on the lease agreement, which started in 2002 because of the runway uh, construction that we were doing. They selected a group. We sat down, negotiated some amendments to the original uh, agreement, and we think it is a good uh, part of the airport family and the, the community uh, to revitalize, to help revitalize this area. We've met and checked with the uh, references of the group, and uh, they are strong, lots of years of experience, and uh, the team here negotiated much more favorable conditions uh, for the airport. And uh, we asked for the approval of this uh, legislation to allow them to assign it to the new group. Thank you, director. And uh, you, you know, I, you and I and, and have spoken about this and I've spoken with the staff as well since the, this is a, um, uh, a property in Ward 17, but um, could you just uh, please give the committee uh, two things? One, uh, a kind of a description of uh, the new lease terms. I understand that this is a much more favorable uh, financial agreement for the city that'll net us some money over over you know the next decades, and then also uh, describe um, the um, you know proposed use. Uh, council person and members of the committee, um, first off, and in, in key to the the whole exchange uh, is that uh, there were rent credits exceeding eight hundred thousand um, dollars to the uh, bomber squadron group. 
uh, that was owed by the city to them. And so in, with the new lease um, group coming in, uh, we uh, negotiated that those would be set to zero. We also negotiated uh, that over um, a, a period of years, um, 500,000 up front, and then another 500,000 afterwards for renovation to the facility to modernize it. The current theme is World War II. However, with its new purpose of uh, event, uh, space, um, small uh, dining and maybe microbrewery, uh, those types of uses, uh, they were going to uh, invest in that. So. Uh, going along with what is going to happen with or is happening with the NASA K development next door, uh, this should uh, help uh, stimulate some economic vitality in, uh, in Ward 17. Thank you. Uh, oh, always excited to hear the word uh, microbrewery. Um, I'll open up the floor to my colleagues, but before doing that, I did get an email from staff that I did forget to call the roll. Um, so uh, that's that's my uh, that's my novice mistake. Uh, 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 could the clerk call the roll, please? Fly. Present. Bishop. Here. Conwell. Joe Jones. Here. Santana. Present. Spencer. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from the members uh, related to Ordinance 30421? Uh, Councilman Casey. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman to the director, did you say that they were changing the theme? Because I know that's been a theme over there on Brook Park Road for Third, over 30 years, um, even when they had the old uh, place on the other side of Grayton Road. Um, so did, did you indicate that they were, yes, changing the theme of the whole restaurant and changing the name and everything? Um, through the chair to the council person, it will be now called the Aviator Event Center. So it's still centered about aviation, uh, but more current uh, aviation than World War II. Uh, and the memorabilia surrounding that, and, um, and then modernizing the facility a bit so that it uh, fits more with what the, what's going on in the area these days, particularly, as I said, with that NASA K um, project uh, really in full swing there. So yes, it will no longer be um, World War II theme. It will still be aviation theme, and there will be renovation to the building to uh, modernize it uh, for the events. Um, our, a personal point of privilege real quick, Mr. Chairman. Um, this, this place is uh, um, pretty historic. Uh, it's where I met my wife uh, 30 years ago. And uh, that's where our, our union started, was at the old uh, 100th Bomb Group when we were both employees there. So uh, it's exciting to, to hear that uh, it's going to be modernized and, and brought up to modern day, but that World War II theme, and there was nothing like walking in there and seeing the pictures of General Patton and the old World War II memorabilia that's been sitting around. But uh, I, I think it's a great project, Mr. Chairman, and congratulations on, on this uh, endeavor in Ward 17. Thank you, Councilman Casey. Uh, any other questions from the committee? Um, with that, uh, the legislation stands approved and uh, we'll uh, move on to finance. And uh, we will move on to Ordinance 310. Uh, ordinance 310 2021, an emergency ordinance authorizing the Director of Port Control to employ one or more professional consultants to enter into one or more management agreements to provide maintenance, operation, and management services for city owned parking lots located in North Coast Harbor for a period of five years, with one option to renew for an additional five-year period, which shall require additional legislative authority. Director Kennedy. Uh, Councilor, uh, Councilperson, members of the committee. Um, the North Coast Harbor um, is, has parking as a main revenue source uh, down at the, at the uh, east of East Ninth Street, uh, the pier, uh, Good Time Three, the restaurant and so forth are supported by this parking. That contract will expire next year in January. 
and to prepare for going out with, uh, to see what uh, provisions are out there for us. Um, we need uh, legislative authority uh, to issue the, the uh, RFQ, uh, RFP. And for that, we seek the, uh, the approval from this committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and uh, from having spoken with you and staff on this legislation, uh, just a couple things to highlight and confirm, uh, if you could, uh, that, you know, the, as you said, this is five years, though the extension requires additional authority. The bid process is subject to, you know, the requirements of OEO. And, um, and, and as you said, this in, in, in the 2020s, uh, maybe not the year to reflect on as far as normal operations, but in a, in a, in a typical year, uh, these parking lots can generate up to about three quarters of a million dollars, which, which support the, 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 the harbors. Exactly. Exactly, sir. Um, any questions from the committee on Ordinance 310-2021? Seeing none, uh, Ordinance 310-2021 uh, stands approved and we'll move on to finance. Uh, and that concludes the legislative portion of, of this hearing. And uh, we can move on to maybe the fun part. Um, Dir Director, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. But as we all know, uh, Cleveland Hopkins has been working on a master plan uh, to uh, really imagine what the airport can be over the coming decades. As, as we all know, the airport has a very utilitarian value to the city and the region. It gets us from here to somewhere else, uh, but around, around the country, around the world, airports are uh, large drivers of economic development, new investment, and uh, we want our airport uh, to be in, in competition uh, with, with others and top quality. So I'm excited uh, by this process and you know, Director Kennedy will turn it over to you and if you could please uh, walk us through this presentation and uh, we'll take questions afterward. Councilperson Sly, thank you. Committee members, thank you for this time. Yes, this is, a, this is an important uh, event as we release this to our final public uh, uh, meeting tonight uh, at six o'clock. Over the last 18 to 20 months, we've had thousands of hours put in by the team, dozens of meetings and hundreds of inputs from stakeholders, individual citizens, uh, many of you, uh, others, our airline partners and so forth, to look at what our path forward would, uh, would be to modernize, be competitive, and certainly uh, prepare. So with our team, uh, we have a, um, a presentation. I'll walk through a few slides to give a snapshot of where we are now. I will turn it over to our uh, Chief of Planning and Engineering, Dennis Kramer, who will talk, take part of it, and then our planning manager, who has been the lead on this master plan and probably has not gotten much sleep over the last 18 months as he's worked through this because it is not often at an airport that you get to work on many uh, master plans, and he has taken great dedication. The whole team has taken, and our consultants, uh, to make sure that this happens. So we'll start through. I'll get out of the way and let the experts uh, uh, go. So, uh, Perfect. And, and, and Director, briefly, the uh, to the members, this has been uh, forwarded to your inbox uh, last night by Ms. Poole Miller, if you want to pull it up to follow along. A request, Director, would be that the version we got is a little grainy. Uh, if we could, um, maybe as a follow-up item, just get another PDF. It looks like this might have been a, a scan of a printout. If uh, Maybe we just need to save it, uh, this presentation as a PDF and get it back to the council. That'd be appreciated. Absolutely. We will do that at the very end of this presentation. Thank so um, for Dennis uh, uh, and Nick, you're running the slideshow. Let's go to the next slide. So these are the areas that we're going to cover. Um, and I will start with the background. So let's go to the background, first background. COVID-19, there's no surprise. In the travel and hospitality industry, I have lived through many things in our industry that have been tipping points for us. The bankruptcies in the early 90s, uh, the tech bubble burst, the 9-11, the recession, 
And at each of those, I said, if I could survive that, I can survive anything. COVID has had the greatest impact on aviation, our country, uh, and uh, uh, the hospitality industry that I have ever experienced in my long career in this industry. 2019 was a good year, a very good year for us. Uh, we exceeded 10 million guests here at the airport, uh, which was the highest number of guests in a dozen years. Um, and uh, we had 11 passenger airport, uh, airlines and there were over 7,500 uh, airport employees, not DPC, but airport employees on the campus. COVID hit us. Uh, in March, significant impact to us. And uh, at the end of the year, we ended the year with only about 40% of what we had the previous year before, 4.1 million uh, guests through the door. We lost one airline, Air Canada, uh, which we hope that will return sometime later this year. And the thing that I think about, and this council has heard me say before, I think about and I pray about those 3,200 jobs that we lost every day. And I am bound and determined that we're gonna get those, get jobs back. And with a master plan that we uh, were talking about over the life of the master plan, we may even be able to double that 7,500 campus-wide job to 15,000 in the planning horizon. So for us, we're, uh, we've had a devastating effect. 3,000, um, uh, over 3,200 jobs. I will report to this committee and to council on periodic base how we're doing towards recapturing those jobs. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's, you see it, and I'm gonna talk about some of our numbers and why we, we feel very confident we'll get those jobs back. Next one, please. Part of what's been happening at, uh, at Cleveland Hopkins is why the need for our master new master plan um, was, I was about to use the word desperately, but was needed greatly. Pre-hub going down, out of every 100 passengers that bought a ticket, not just went through the US airport, bought a ticket in Ohio, about 78 of them went through here, chose Cleveland Hopkins, 21 of them chose Akron, and one chose Youngstown. After the hub went down, new carriers came in, our airfares have gone down 35% since 2014. And now if you look, 93 out of every 100 passengers that buy tickets, and we get this information from DOT, select this airport. And now six go to uh, Akron. And that's about one third of where Akron was back pre our, in our pre hub day, in our hub days. So our, uh, this means and translates literally to jobs here in Cleveland that are not no longer in Akron or Youngstown because of uh, the uh, travelers selecting us. Next one. So how are we doing? I talked about the, uh, the effects of COVID-19 and what it did. We had been on a, a very good trajectory, 2017, 2018, 2019. In 2017, we grew at four times what the FAA had forecasted us to grow. Three times that forecast in 2018 and double that forecast in 2019. And last year, we were um, our recovery was higher than the national average and has remained so. If even this data goes through April, but as we look into May right now, um, Cleveland is recovering at about 57%, and the national average is uh, recovering at about 51%. In our last seven days, we've averaged over 20,000 guests through the doors, 20,000. And we're forecasting over 2 million people will come through this summer. And to give a comparison to COVID 2020 summer numbers, we saw about 300,000. 300, um, and our markets, our markets are pre-COVID, we had 52 markets. With the June schedule, we'll have 47, and we're still working on more. And uh, that speaks a lot to the strength of the marketplace. It speaks a lot 
to the confidence the air carriers have uh, in us as an airport organization and as Northeast Ohio in the catchment area. Next one, please. One thing that will continue over the next couple of years is how our air carriers will change. If you go back to uh, 2019, United had 28% of the market, Southwest, American, it's Delta, so forth. January and February last year, pre-COVID impact, United had dropped to 25%. Uh, Delta was at 16, had grown to 16, and you see the other percentages there. This year, uh, or last year, January and February, uh, I mean this year, sorry, um, United had dropped to 22%, Frontier to 18%, and Spirit at 16 So our, our diversification of carriers, which helps keep our airfare loads, which help generate jobs, is, being, uh, is continuing uh, to change as we go forward. And in fact, one of those airlines has just contacted us last week about increasing their footprint here. And we had meetings with United corporate people here in uh, Cleveland last week about their schedule for June of this year and what they were going to do. So the measures, and I gotta say, we took some extreme measures over the last two years, uh, has built a lot of confidence in what we can do for our future. Next one, please. So I like I like to end my section with this. Mayor Jackson initiated the, uh, the master plan in October of 2019. It's before we ever we ever thought about anything about COVID, and it was because we were seeing significant constraints upon our facilities here. And Mayor Jackson was always talking about how we prepare for the for the future for us. And so he initiated. The team got to work with the consultants and our stakeholders to come up with a, a, a master plan for what we should go forward. And six key parts of that. Any airport, any airport to be efficient must have a balance between the airfield, the terminal, the land side and the airspace. If any one of those is out of balance with the other three, it cannot, and I repeat, cannot be efficient. So our airspace was redesigned. It's not part of our domain. Um, is It's the domain of the FAA. That was re redesigned in 2018 by the FAA to, um, to make it more efficient and reduce down the impact. And uh, that should last us through the 20-year planning horizon for our master plan. The airfield, it is with the three runways, the two parallels that are long, and the one crosswind, we don't need to add any more uh, runways. We do need to do a lot of work over the next 10 years on those on that airfield, and uh, but we will not need to expand beyond our current boundaries of the airport. We do not need to change geometry or heading of the uh, runways, uh, so which is very good news because that becomes very expensive. Where we're significantly out of balance, and the team will go over more of this information in a moment, is in our terminal. We have a pre-9-11 design and built terminal in a post-9-11 and now a post-COVID environment. And our landside operations, our roadways, our parking, our rental car, all of that was not ever considered for the type of airport that we are now. 97, almost 98% of all travelers now start or end their trip here in Cleveland. Before we had a large percentage of our travelers that never left the terminal. And what that does, that puts a lot of strain on the roadway, the expressway, the parking, everything that there is there. So these were the, the six criteria that we looked at. And I wanna point just to the last one down there that is, um, we heard a lot of feedback a lot of I have a lot of personal opinion about this particular. I want people to know they're in Cleveland when they step off the plane or when they're in this term. And it's not only just the Rock Hall, and that's great, but it's our lake, it's our metro parks, it's all the other richness of our history and our diversity and all of that that we need to make sure that when we do go to design phase and um, we go to construction, that that identity, that strength that makes us 
the Cleveland that we are is preserved. So I'll be quiet. I could talk all day on this without a lot of desire, but I know we have a finite amount of time. And I will turn it over to Dennis Kramer in uh, our executive conference room here uh, to take you through he, through uh, a few other sections. Dennis. Uh, thank you, Robert. Good morning. It looks like uh, Councilperson Bishop uh, raised his hand um, before we move on. Yes, Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, through the chairman. Uh, to the director, you talked about the land side, but you didn't touch on the airspace. Um, could you touch on our airspace, the balance um, with the airspace as it relates to the other items that we that we talked about, like the terminal, uh, the runways, and, and things like that? Uh, through the council person, to, uh, through the chair to the council person, I'm sorry, I thought... Uh, the airspace is, is the controlled space by the FAA. And in 2018, that was redesigned to be more efficient. Uh, and the reason we got the redesign is because our airspace is integral with the Detroit airspace, which is a, a much significantly busier airspace. So the corridors that, uh, that were set up on, with the headings of our runways, that means the direction of our runways, and the meteorological, meteorological conditions that we had designed it to be much more efficient and it should not need redesign uh, as we go over the 20 year planning horizon. Fortunately, we have Nick Belluardo who was uh, led that charge for the airport. And let me ask him if there's anything he would like to add from um, the, the engineering and the FAA part that he worked with. Nick, would you like to make any comments that I've left out? Thank you, Director. The only thing I would add, too, is that, you know, when, when we mentioned this airspace redesign, this was, you know, beyond just here in Cleveland, this is the airspace that spans, as he mentioned, from, from Cleveland to Detroit and all that traffic that's coming out of New England, circling around Lake Erie and continuing westbound. So this was high level airspace all the way down to the ground, changing some flight routes around. And uh, I think the project went very successful and, and it's been uh, no issue since implementation. Okay, um, through the chairman to the director. So our airspace, um, we don't really have very much control over our airspace is kind of done through the FAA. Is that what you're saying? Uh, through the chair to the council for that's absolutely absolutely right. That is the the national airspace is the domain of the FAA. Okay, so through the chairman to the director, um, if our traffic and our flights increase, um, if if we increase our landings and our takeoff, will the FAA go back to revisit our airspace and how we are set up with our airspace? Well, is that correct to say? Uh, through the chair to the council person. At a certain level, yes, um, but we're far beyond uh, the capacity or the need to redesign for many years uh, and what our forecasted uh, aircraft movements will be. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the FAA, uh, DOT is always looking at um, what's the most efficient uh, national um, airspace plan out there. So if there was a problem of congestion uh, where we had a lot of holdouts, uh, a lot of diversions and so forth because of uh, airspace congestion, uh, yes, um, that would be the case. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as uh, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and, and members of the committee for having me as well. Uh, again, I'm Dennis Kramer. I'm the Chief of Planning and Engineering uh, for the Department of Port Control. Um, I'm going to talk about kind of the process of the master plan a bit. So um, the, the master plan itself is a very prescribed process that the FAA uh, gives us guidance. Um, and so the first, and, and there's multiple steps in, as we go through the process here. So. The very first thing we do as part of this process is to look very high level at what we call the vision. Um, and really, you know, what that boils down to is a SWOT analysis to see our strengths, our weaknesses, our opportunities, and our threats. And uh, I won't read all these for you here, but, you know, these, this started as a, as a much uh, larger list 
Um, and then as we as we looked at all the all the different things we identified as strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, we boiled it down to these being uh, some of the more uh, critical items that we would focus on. So that, that was kind of the first step. Next slide, please. From there, we move on to the forecasting stage. And we, what we do is we look at uh, forecast of aviation, our passenger levels, uh, aircraft operations, uh, cargo, all the different aspects of our facility and, and forecast out for the next 20 years um, where we think those numbers are going to be. And, and from there, you know, that will be the basis of what is our next step in developing our uh, facility requirements. And, and I'll get into the facility requirements a little bit more um, in a bit. But th this, this next slide here is about our planning activity levels. Now I'm gonna spend a, a few extra seconds on this one because this is a very important slide. These numbers are, are very important to the process. Um, the planning activity levels are our passenger levels, right? And so um, back in 2019, as, as we mentioned before, uh, we were at 10.1 million passengers. Our planning activity level one um, is, that, is that threshold, is that 10.1 million passengers. Our planning activity level two, uh, moving forward into the process here, will be 10.9 million passengers, followed by planning activity level three at 12 million, and, and finally that 20-year that forecast in the future, that PAL-5 is 13.5 million passengers. And what these are are essentially our trigger points. Um, so the master plan itself isn't, um, hey, in 2027, we're going to build a new concourse, um, anything like that. The plan is developed based on these uh, planning activity levels. So when we hit these certain thresholds, these certain passenger level trigger points, we say these are the projects that we need to implement as part of the plan. We need to expand this. We need to expand that. Um, and I see we have a, a, a hand raised, so I will, I will open the floor, I guess. Councilwoman Spencer. Thank you. Uh, through the chair to Mr. Kramer, just wanting to make sure I understand um, this point. On what basis uh, is the 20 year projection 13.5 million passengers? I might have asked my question too early, maybe getting to that. What's the basis for the, uh, through the chair, what's the basis for the 13.5 million? Uh, number. I'm going to turn that over to Nick to answer. Go ahead, Nick. Thank you, Dennis. Through the chair, Through the, chair to, the, to the committee here. The, uh, you know, some of the things we, we, we do kind of put some, some years around these numbers of, of where is PAL 1, PAL 2, and, and all the way through PAL 5. Again, PAL 1 being a return to baseline. And, and you know, we, we kind of look at this as a 20-year as a plan. Um, but also keep in mind that, that we may outpace our forecast or maybe we're, we're just under it. And so the, the implementation of projects is to occur not at a, at a specific point in time, but a point in time when passenger activity hits the marks as shown earlier uh, through PAL-1 all the way through PAL-5. Uh, but broad, broadly speaking, we're looking at uh, Past your activity over a 20-year window here, 20, 25-year window. Uh, Nick, if you don't mind me jumping in and, and, and helping, I, I thought I heard the question is, how do you make these forecasts? Uh, we do this forecast in, in conjunction with FAA, with the science, with the knowledge of, uh, of the airlines and the, the activity that's going to be here. And uh, we use a lot of historical data and modeling algorithm models on the future based on what we see. There have been many downturns in aviation. Um, the recession of 08, 09, 9-11, Y2K, tech bubble, the bankruptcies in the 90s and blah, blah, blah. Aviation always comes back. And the, the data that I used earlier is actually running ahead of what we thought the forecast would be at this time. Um, based on our most recent forecast last. So this is a 20 year forecast. If you look at the bottom of the side where it says terminal area forecast, that is what is done by the FAA. Um, then the consultation with the modelers and mathematicians and programmers to come up with that. That's, I hope that's helpful. I didn't, hopefully I didn't confuse the issue. 
Councilmember Spencer, anything else? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think I understand. I just um, noticing it's helpful that this goes back uh, to 1999 data. It looks like the last time we had anything close to 13 million passengers was in 1999, around the late 90s. Um, and I'm just noting that uh, uh, I'm optimistic that our regional population will grow over time and that we could we could reach such a number. But um, you made the comment uh, through the chair to, to our, our director that um, right now most, right, we don't have the, um, the in-transit passengers, that the, the passengers are originating from our, our region, from, from the Cleveland area. And so is this based on population growth in the region? Um, I, I just, I know that we're, we're new to this and we're not in the industry with you and that these forecasts are based on industry trends as well. But I have to imagine some of this is based on sheer population growth as well or anticipated, uh, given the fact that flights are originating flights really are serving our population here in Northeast Ohio. Uh, through the chair to the council person, that is part of the equation. Uh, I showed you a slide uh, back about uh, out of every 100 passengers, how many chose Cleveland Hopkins versus Akron Canton versus Youngstown. We have that data for Columbus, Toledo, uh, Detroit, and so forth. But we're capturing more people are choosing to come here where in the past they did not. Uh, and as there are more limited resources and probably will be for the next couple of years of aircraft and crews in the air, airlines are also consolidating. So our catchment area is the term we use in the industry is expanding. So think of it as a net, uh, people will drive a little further uh, than they had in the past uh, to catch flights. And the, the, the change in uh, air carriers here bringing lower fares uh, is also being very attractive. So you can go out to our parking deck right now and you'll see some tags from New York. You'll see tags from Pennsylvania uh, uh, out there. And that's almost every day of the world. So our, our area that we attract passengers from is getting larger. Yes, uh, population growth. Uh, and also in that is not a pure population growth. It's disposable income and mobility of uh, new workers that help contribute to the need of air transportation. I, I hope that was helpful. Uh, through the chair to the director, that that's pretty that's a pretty good job given that you're you're speaking with folks who aren't part of the industry. Thank you very much. Through the chair, you're welcome. Anytime you want more information on this, uh, I've spent four decades in this and you learn a thing or two, so thank you. And, uh, Councilman Bishop. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, to the, um, I don't know if it's, to, it, it could be to one of the guys that was explaining the presentation, I'm not sure his name, but as we, when you put the screen up about the planning activity levels, and I see from planning activity level two to three is a five year window and from three to four, it's a five year window. And he mentioned that as we move to certain levels, certain things would happen. But from, from planning le activity level one to two, I noticed this is, it's in the same year uh, in 2024. And explain why that uh, from one to two is, is in the same year versus from two to three is a five year uh, 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 span. Could you explain that? Sure, Th through the chair to the council person. So in our, in our forecasting, our planning activity level one and our planning activity level two, if you can go back one slide, Nick, they are the same level. They are those, they are those uh, 2019 levels is, is planning activity level one. And as you move forward to planning activity level two, um, ten, at the 10.9 million passengers, that's go ahead to the next slide, please. We're anticipating being back somewhere between in those 2019 um, 10.1 to 10.9 million passengers sometime around the 2024 mark. Um, so that we're just given the visual of that's where we're anticipating being back in that range, in that planning activity level one to planning activity level two. Okay. And right. Dennis, if I may add too, and uh, I know Mr. Hogan is from our team who does our forecasting, uh, short-term forecasting is on, 
But our original forecast uh, for 2020 was 10.5 to 10.6 million guests here at the airport. So we were exceeding that planning activity level and rapidly marching towards uh, the planning activity level two. Uh, so uh, the recovery, and again, what we see in our discussions with the carriers and all the macroeconomics are saying, that's probably when we need to be prepared to take on those projects that we need to accommodate uh, that, num that level of traffic. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, uh, please continue with the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so moving on, next slide, please. Uh, go ahead, next slide. So uh, the next kind of step in the master plan process is we look at our facility requirements. So we had our vision, our, our forecast, everything. So now we take that information and we start looking at what we have um, and what we're going to need uh, to meet those, the, the forecast demand. And so in that process, uh, Robert mentioned that um, we had significant uh, critical deficiencies in our terminal and our land side facilities. And so these, these couple items here are the, uh, the largest, the critical elements that we identified. And as you can see from the right there, um, our ticketing check-in area, our, our front lobby there, currently we have about 7,700 square feet. And uh, you know, right out the gate, planning activity level one, where we were in 2019, we we're already deficient in, in our space needs um, at 11,200 square feet. Our check baggage inspection systems, uh, again, all of these similar story, uh, significant spatial deficiencies in these. Our security screening checkpoints are approximately half the size that they need to be currently. Um, one other uh, point to make about the security screening checkpoints is uh, we currently have three and, um, you know, in, in the industry, the, the most efficient uh, configuration for a security screening is a centralized checkpoint. So we have ours kind of segmented into three different areas. Uh, the, the most efficient would be one single larger uh, security screening checkpoint. Our, our gate waiting areas um, also are, are undersized. And then our gates, we're, we're a couple gates short as well. So... You know, that's, that's the terminal side. If you look at our land side, again, significant deficiencies here on our land side. Um, our curb configuration, um, you know, right now, our, our, uh, our dwell times out on the curb um, are approximately, our, our, our consultant, um, you know, analyzed how long people wait out there and, and all of that to, to see how it affected the congestion. And um, it, it was approximately four to five minutes, I believe, was, was the dwell time that they calculated. Um, you know, national, national norms are significantly lower than that. Um, so that was one issue about um, enforcement and, and our operations out on the roadway itself. Um, however, moving on to the actual configuration of the roadway, as I'm sure you all know, our, our roadway is kind of configured in a V formation. And, um, you know, it, that, that, that shows that like when, when a car comes up that people can, folks can't see uh, down the curb to see if there's more space available. So they kind of wait there at the, at the front. So, um, you know, right out the gate there that um, the configuration itself uh, lends to those longer dwell times. Um, so a revised roadway system was identified as, as a major need, um, increase the distance between the airport entrance and the terminal, eliminate um, the, the congestion on 237 actually entering into our campus, uh, we all know if you're driving in that area, there's a lot of different lanes crossing all over the place. And um, then there's our inbound traffic signals as soon as you get on our campus as well. All lend to that, uh, that uh, congestion right there in our roadway system. Uh, improve walkability and convenience of our ground transportation center. Uh, we're currently working on that right now. Um, we need to add uh, additional walkable parking spaces, public parking spaces. Uh, we need more rental car storage spaces and we need to improve the RTA accessibility and convenience as well. Next slide, please. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a hand raised. Uh, Councilwoman Spencer, did you have a, a point of clarification or a question? Mr. Chair, I can hold my questions if you'd like, or I, 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 however you recommend proceeding. Let's, I did have questions about the terminal slide. Let's, let's hold that question because I know they're going to be coming with a, a couple concepts. So um, thank you. 
Okay, so uh, part of the master plan as well is, you know, we need to look at our own facilities, and the master plan doesn't get too deep into the regional transportation system. Uh, however, we do need to address it uh, in, in some capacity, and we need to identify how the regional uh, roadway system would tie into our campus if there were any changes to be made. Um, so we looked at a few different concepts on, on how our campus interacts with the regional roadway system. Um, the, the top right there and the bottom right there uh, were a few concepts that we explored. Um, ultimately, though, uh, we ended on our preferred alternative uh, will end up being this regional access concept three. And um, this is a direct connection from Interstate 71, uh, a, a revised interchange uh, that would provide an elevated roadway system uh, tying directly into our campus. Um, this, would, this would eliminate uh, airport traffic on State Route 237. And uh, to get to this, this uh, concept, this uh, alternative being our preferred alternative, we did form uh, what we called a, a regional transportation subcommittee. Uh, we had uh, folks from ODOT, NOACA, um, all the, the local municipalities, uh, several stakeholder groups, and uh, the, the um, you know, many, many, we had many, uh, much of that uh, transportation subcommittee was in support of this uh, regional access concept three. Um, one other stat I'll leave you with this on is that approximately 95% of uh, airports in the country, uh, similar size to us or larger, have a configuration uh, just like this, where they have a direct connection to uh, a major interstate. Uh, we're in that 5% uh, group that, that we're, we're tied into more of a, a state route or a, or a local route. And, and so this is the majority of how uh, you know, campuses and, and facilities like us are tied into regional roadway system. Uh, so that all led to, you know, this, this being chosen as a preferred alternative for the regional access. Next slide, please. Another part of the master plan, we do look at all of our other, we call them other facilities. Uh, this would include our general aviation, um, our air, or, you know, uh, airline maintenance, our cargo facilities, corporate aviation, all these other facilities that aren't um, our terminal or land side and, and that some of our tenants uh, utilize. And so, there, you know, there's a lot, there's a, there's a lot put into this uh, as well. Um, but, you know, the, the overall summary of where we ended up with these other facilities is we do have uh, some deficiencies in these areas as well. Um, but the, the, you know, the solution to these is that we need to better utilize our existing uh, land that we have. Uh, currently, you know, our, our layout of how, how our campus is arranged isn't, isn't set up in the most uh, efficient manner. So uh, utilization of the space we have is, is key to uh, moving forward and having a, a very efficient uh, facility and, and campus. Next slide, please. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to our planning manager, Nick Belluardo, and he's gonna talk about some of the more uh, uh, technical aspects and, and alternatives. Go ahead, Nick. Thank you, Chief. So this is where the master plan really got fun. Uh, when, we, when we got to look at what is the future going to be for Cleveland Hopkins, and we started this, uh, you know, we started with that, that justification, why we need to do it. We went into the vision of some guiding principles that we want to carry through it, and then we took that snapshot in time. What is the airport today? And based on our forecast, where are we going and what do we need based on those forecasts? So that gave us the building blocks that we could start fitting together in terms of terminal size and capacities and capability of our facilities. And so we started with six families here and, and, and they vary greatly. And we started with these six and it was kind of an unrestricted view of what we can, what we can do here. Then we were able to narrow it down to family one, two, and six and we looked at those three families in a little bit more detail. Um, once we looked at family six, you know, and, and financial feasibility, uh, it was maybe just outside our, our capability. And so we really narrowed in on family one and two and went into great detail into those. Some other factors that went into play here, like in family four, well, it looks like a, a, a great facility there. Excuse me. We also looked at constructability. We have to keep this airport open and operational during these improvements. So again, we came into family one and family two, and those are what I'm gonna share with you here. 
Family one, uh, largely focused on renovation as opposed to new concourses. It, it includes renovation of concourse D, an above ground walkway connector that will then allow passengers to access the concourse D. We looked at the, uh, the tunnel that goes beneath the ramp. However, it does offer a, a fairly low customer service. And the new concourse here is really only concourse B, which is one of our older facilities dating all the way back to the 19, late 1950s and 60s in, in their initial build and improvement. Dennis mentioned earlier about the access road uh, coming in at our land side uh, 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 drop off line. And this straightens that out by essentially connecting the two corners of our terminal building. Versus when we look at family two, this extends one of the legs of our current terminal. And over time, this terminal does get replaced. So in family two, the difference is, is one concourse here gets renovated, and that would be concourse A, with the addition of new concourse B, C, D, and E. And E is a very critical part here. Um, if we look at concourse E as, as a future development and that builds capacity, our gate capacity, that we need to later shut down one half of concourse B so that we can construct that future concourse. So that goes into a little bit of phasing here, but this is the ultimate build out of, of what Cleveland Hopkins will look like. We ultimately settled upon family two as our preferred alternative with a lot of the, the, the comments already made here. Um, and we'll get into some numbers in just a moment, but, but family two has a lower construction cost initially in these initial planning phases that match, matches up well with our debt structure and our retirement of debt in the years to come. And when we looked at the, uh, the level of service it provides, operational efficiency and long-term maintenance, family two came out ahead. Some key findings that as we went through the study, the comparative uh, uh, from family one and family two, Again, family two, less long-term maintenance, less operational costs over family one, better land use and efficiency, and better use, you know, expanding beyond our planning horizon here, and a more efficient layout, both land side and air side. We looked at a pretty detailed project cost, and then, and then the total program cost, as you can see down at the bottom there. One thing we kept in mind through this is, is these are our forecasted costs of construction and improvement. And with that, there's about a 20% margin of error. Now with a $1.8 billion plan and a $2 billion total program plan, those are within a 20% margin of error. And so what, what we did was say, for, you know, as far as we know, these, these both families could be equal in cost. So let's put money aside and really focus on what gives Cleveland the best facility. And when we did that, again, we came, we came to the conclusion of family two, and as you can see, this is how the, some of those programming costs break out. And I've got a great visual coming up here that'll show you that phasing of how we get to where we wanna go. A few more details, as, as previously mentioned, family two focuses on new construction as opposed to renovation, where family one is, is a little more heavy on, on, on renovation and, and uh, a little heavier on renovation than new construction. Concourses, we, we see the four new concourses in family two as opposed to one new concourse in family one. Nick, can I add something there too? Um, so just, just to add to this about you know new construction versus renovation, some of our facilities are currently over 65 years old and, and some of them date back uh, to when aircraft were propeller driven. Um, that, that just gives you an idea that, you know, even in many of these facilities have out, you know, they're past their useful life. Um, so a program um, that is associated with more new construction uh, versus renovation is, is going to be in the long term much more beneficial uh, for the airport system. Thank you, Chief. So now we, we know where we want to go and we have to put the, the implementation plan of how we get there. How do we phase in all these projects and improvements to ultimately get to our preferred alternative. So the next few slides kind of walk through that and, and feel free to ask to go back to a slide after we go through these. PAL2, that initial, that initial trigger level, focuses on, on the following projects. And the big ones here are, are moving our rental car facility 
over to the airport. That's something that exp is expressed by, many times over the course of this study, offers a higher level of service. So that's a big project. Uh, the other big project here is, is the addition of Concourse E, demolition of Concourse D, and then followed by Concourse B, minor renovations to Concourse A in the terminal area. We call this phase 2.5 or planning activity level 2.5. This is when we start getting into the land side that preps the facility so that we can eventually build out to that ultimate concept. This is largely a roadway uh, a phase of our, our study and our, and our implementation plan, as you can see here. Uh, brings the traffic in off 237, widens the circle, so to say, and increases our drop-off roadway. Planning activity level three starts filling in that circle with surface parking, new parking structures, a new cell phone lot, and again, we see some concourse work in PAL three. We come into PAL five, there's some terminal expansion, and we get into the, 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 the final concourse, new concourse D, I should clarify. And the concept that, that Chief Dennis here showed us, Chief Dennis Kramer showed us earlier, where, those, uh, where the uh, preferred alternative was that, that direct connector from 71, we show that in green here. That's, that's when we get to time that into our new facility. One thing we kept in mind throughout this process was this has to be financially affordable and feasible. We, we cannot uh, propose a plan that is going to sit on a shelf. We wanted this to be something we could carry through all the way to implementation. And so we did a lot of financial modeling and, and, and you know, kept in mind we want to stay competitive. And uh, when we look at family two, or I'm sorry, planning activity level two, within our financial capability, PAL 3, again, within our financial capacity here. And then we get into PAL 5, and we did find a deficit of about $200 million in the total program of the, of the, of the plan here. However, there's, there's some things, you know, this is based on, on, on forecasting activity, and there's some things that may change in the future that increases our financial capacity. And one of those things, just, just to give you an example of one, is it's called a passenger facility fee that, that most airports do uh, charge users at, at the airport, and that has not been, it was implemented in 92 at $3. It was increased in 2001 to $4.50. Since that time, it has not changed in 20 years. And so we, we, when we worked these financial models, we were using $4.50. However, I think as an industry, we do hope to see an increase soon in our PFC. The other thing I'd like to note here is all these improvements, when we look at these, this, this total program, is funded by user fees here at the airport and not off local tax revenue. And I think that's, that's an important comment to, to make. Our contingency plan, so to say, was, well, what if, what if we, we can't accommodate that, that $200 million in projects? And we, we looked at a deferred program and we said, what, what projects can we say, okay, we can push those off beyond PAL-5 until a point that we can then afford them? And so this, this takes a look at that, um, it, and it eliminates a lot of our, our, our costs around temporary parking and a temporary cell phone lot, and, and some of those temporary measures that would be niceties to have, but cost savings if we cut those out. And that puts our complete plan within financial feasibility. So I know we just boiled about a year and a half study in, the, in, the, in about 40 minutes here, but our next steps here is really to take all our documentation or our findings and we deliver those to the FAA. And the FAA is gonna review these and, and we do expect, you know, it could be a six month review from the FAA and we're looking for an approval and signature on our airport layout plan and our forecast. And, and once we get that going, you know, we're getting, we're go head into putting some of these projects into play and, uh, you know, I, I want to thank you guys for allowing us to, to share this with you. And Director Kennedy, I will turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, before we get to questions and answers, I just want to be very clear that this master plan is a path forward. Rarely does a master plan begin and end the planning horizon exactly the same, but it is a path forward. We will do it in consultation with our carriers who stand behind our debt our debt 
as we issue it here at the airport. Uh, this plan is bold, it's big. However, it will only be a wish if we're not efficient, if we're non-competitive, if we fail to comply with regulatory requirements, we lack transparency, and we do not ensure inclusions for all areas of our city. If we have the conviction for a brighter future, we must remember the millions of people we serve and we will never meet. We cannot let our path forward fall by the wayside because of personal agendas and benefit. Clevelanders and our guests deserve better air transportation with the required facilities to support that endeavor. Mayor Jackson said yesterday at the Amtrak announcement, where there's good, effective, efficient modes of transportation, you will always get commerce to flow and investment opportunities to occur. Certainly this is what has been proven repeatedly as it relates to airport. In my career, I've seen airports in almost 100 countries. I've had the good pleasure of working with some of the finest airport organizations in the world. And there is, in my mind, no reason that Cleveland cannot be that as well. So that's my comments. Uh, and uh, the team's data will be glad to take any questions. Thank you, thank you Director, um, to uh, you and your team. Uh, Clearly, there's been a, a lot of work that has gone into this, and you know, I, I had the opportunity to uh, get a preview of this last week, and and it's 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 pretty exciting stuff. I, I am not even though I understood the scope of the master plan to see it and to begin, you know, imagining what the Cleveland Hopkins of the future can be. It's exciting. And, you know, as someone who, uh, you know, used to travel a lot for work, you know, you'll get into an airport and you uh, get into that rental car and then you're you know, like, or, you know, onto the train, you're leaving the airport. And that's really the airport's your, your gateway, your first impression of, of the city. And, um, you know, if anyone's ever flown Southwest out of Hopkins, uh, you know that it can, it can be a little bit of tight quarters. Uh, there, there's certainly a need uh, for nearer term improvements, but then having that longer 20 year vision uh, is, is something that really positions our region for success. Um, you know, just a couple things to touch on um, as, as, you know, to the members, as the director and his team mentioned, there's an FAA approval process and there's been a high level of engagement with, um, you know, not only our committee, but surrounding communities, regional leaders, what have you, really working to get the A team together to coalesce behind uh, this idea and this process and, 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 and the future of our airport. And, and I really hope that uh, uh, other members will join me in, in really an advocacy role uh, for the airport. We'll be a stronger region. We'll be able to attract uh, more growth. We'll be uh, creating jobs within the terminal as we're able to enact this plan moving forward. And, and, and at these early stages, um, our advocacy can go a long way in, in, in helping to um, uh, build up that support and, and see this moving forward. Um, and, and um, you know, it's, 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 it's really, the, in, we, we, earlier this week, we saw a big presentation for the lakefront, and it's exciting to uh, imagine how our increased connectivity to the lakefront uh, can occur and how that could in, improve Cleveland. And, and to me, this is, this, this is a, a, a similar process of thinking through how we can uh, position our city for the future. A um, couple important things to note. Um, you know, I it's want to underscore again that there's an ability to reimagine and rebuild our airport uh, without relying on subsidy from Cleveland taxpayers. I think that's key. I think that is is something that I want everybody as we bro broaden this out and speak with the community to understand uh, that uh, there's an opportunity to not have to come to the general fund. And uh, the director also touched on multimodal. There's an opportunity, you know, if you've ever gone to the DC area, you can fly into BWI, get on the Amtrak and get into the city. There's a real ability as, as we talk about the airport and Amtrak and uh, to match the rest of the country in, in multimodal options. Um, 
before I uh, move over to council member Spencer, uh, Director Kennedy, you did mention that there's a community meeting tonight and, and I'm sure that's a virtual meeting. Uh, if that is something uh, we can help drive attendance to, I, I'm, I'm sure we'd be eager to help. What are the details of that meeting? And if someone wants to participate, how do they, uh, how would they do so? Uh, council person, thank you. Um, it is a virtual meeting uh, as um, we've been doing with all these public engagement and working groups and regional access, and they can sign up on our website. Um, it is the, the you know, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, Nick, you got to help me with the address. Uh, it's clevelandairportmasterplan.com, yes, no, no I think. Clevelandairportmasterplan.com. Follow the tabs to workshops, and you can register for tonight's presentation there. Thank you, Nick. And uh, with that, uh, Council Member Spencer, thank you for uh, holding off on and, and uh, you know, uh, as we got through the presentation, I, I appreciate that. So it's a lot. It's a lot to get through, and I was trying to take questions because there's so much to wrap your head around. I, I wanted to make sure everyone, everyone was singing the same tune throughout. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, even though that was a great presentation, regretfully, I do have questions. I think I just need to clarify my understanding of a few items. This, this is quite complex. Thank you. Um, I do want to start, uh, if we can, through the chair uh, to our airport team, re return to the slide on the budget. I, I, Again, we were moving quickly. This was great information. Um, I think uh, oh, we just saw it. We just flashed. There you go. Um, if that, this is our budget slide, correct? Um, that's, cor that's correct. Okay. So I, I think the talking point that, that Councilman Slife mentioned was important about uh, no direct subsidy from, from taxpayers and Cleveland taxpayers in terms of the general fund. Can we quickly run through again then uh, how, how these improvements would are anticipated to be paid for? It's a mix of user fees and bond issuance, but I, I just wanna make sure I have a clear understand, clearer understanding. Through the chairperson to the council person. Um, yes, it, 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 we, uh, we take out bonds, we have revenue that comes in, the airlines stand behind 100% of our indebtedness. So if we were to go out of, uh, out of business, declare bankruptcy, the airlines would be the ones that would be on the hook for that. So we look at, there's uh, general, uh, general airport revenue bonds, which is a GARB uh, ad that we get, uh, and that's based upon the financial feasibility that's generally a bulk of it. Our passenger facility charges, uh, uh, which we get um, uh, based upon the number of employments that we have, that's part of it. Any grants that we would get from the federal go government, either through FAA, DOT, or any earmarks, since earmarks are back uh, in Congress will help us. And our financial capability as far as uh, looking at new revenue streams, new investment, maybe hangers uh, that may be coming online to pay rent and so forth here. Again, we want to remain, it's key, it was key through our conversations with uh, not only the airlines, but everyone, it, this, is, this is a tough competitive business and got even tougher this last year to keep our cost to the airlines per employment at levels that we saw in 2019 and we're forecasting for 2020. So that's the type of uh, uh, financing that, ha that happens around airports and uh, it will be done in consultation before we ever, we ever decide to go forward. We gotta make sure the, the financing is there and, and actually the, doing the master plan is the easy part uh, and a lot of work is in a lot of uh, science and, and engineering has gone into this and it's not to diminish the work that they've done, but the next part is the financing and that's the heavy lift where we finance that first phase. I like to call it 780 to uh, $800 million to get us where we need to be um, very soon planning and that is the discussion that will be hard. Uh, and particularly in the environment. But we have been setting the table for the last three years on those ratios and those metrics that are important to put us in the best position. And there is a whole, I have a good friend who teaches at Purdue Aviation Financing, 
<laughs> and there's a whole line of study that goes with that, but that's it. it. It is not reliant upon tax revenues from the local municipality or county. Through the chair to the director, thank you. Um, I'm getting there. Um, I, I think I you you somewhat answered my next question uh, regarding um, the flexibility of the plan as it's been presented. So so through through the chair to to the director, you've seen in some of the presentation that uh, although there there everyone can make their do their best to to make projections about what. Um, volume and activity may look like. There's so many factors, you know, God forbid another pandemic. Surely that won't happen, right? But, there, but there's many factors that could impact um, the, the need over time. So I think my question is, uh, through the chair, how flexible is, is this, this vision in terms of, um, it seems like the first nut that needs to be cracked is this phase one, um, but then at that point, would there be reevaluations, different, um, Different, different, different projections, kind of taking a look at that over time to make sure that we are indeed meeting the projected need uh, to the best of everyone's ability to discern that. Through the chair to the council person, excellent question. And the whole science, and I hate to keep coming saying the science behind master planning, the engineering principle, the math principle is it must be flexible. That's why we use planning activity levels. At every step, we look and see what is the need. Um, I will tell you, I arrived here in 2017 as airport director, I was selected. And in 2017, in January, when I arrived, I had people telling me the previous summer, the summer of the RMC, was the, probably the pinnacle of what we were gonna do in the near term. The very next summer, the summer of 17, we exceeded passengers in the month of July, which was the RNC, by a half a million people. And we ended the year by adding a million seats into this market, four times what was forecasted. The next year, three times, and in, in 2019, that summer of the uh, uh, summer period, we exceeded the, the summer of the RNC by more than a million. So you go forward one more year, and we were down to 300,000 passengers for our summer. So we have to be pliable, it has to be flexible. If you look at what Pittsburgh, they were in the middle of their uh, master plan uh, implementation when COVID hit uh, and they had to be pliable. They were readjusting, retooling and going forward with it. The same as any other airport. And that's, that's the practice that we have to do. Um, through, through the chair, I, I think I just, for now, we'll, we'll just uh, uh, have a couple more questions. Um, I, it would be really helpful to me to look, if we can, at a previous slide to really understand. Um, I know we said uh, family two is the preferred or the recommended at this point. How does that really compare to our current footprint? I just, I don't have that visual kind of memorized, right, of what our current is versus what Family 2 is saying, um, trying to wrap my mind around the need for demolition and new construction as opposed to renovation. And then um, the final piece of this question is, um, is Concourse D, D the one that has been closed that when we opened uh, for the United Hub and then it's been closed for a number of years and kind of mothballed? trying to understand again our current footprint versus what, what's needed here. Through the chair to the council person, I'll turn this over to Nick and Dennis for a moment. Uh, the concourse D is a big question that we get, the old concourse D. When we and there's been a lot of conversation around that, but to real life D, it was not built for an aircraft that we have today. The aircraft that use D and primarily use are out of the air service, national air transportation. So the cost, and we have all these breakdown, uh, just to re-life D to make it for the aircraft that we have now, uh, would be over a hundred million dollars, hmm. where we can spend significantly less to improve the service with Concourse E as diagrammed here. And I'm gonna turn it over to Dennis and uh, Nick right now, because they'll describe the outline of our current facility uh, versus what we think the ultimate family two will be. Nick? 
It is. Th through the chair to the council person, uh, Nick brought up here kind of the, the footprint that, that you were you're looking for. If you look, um, the red outline is, is our current footprint. It, do it doesn't show Concourse D down there to the south, but uh, the red outline is uh, the current footprint of our terminal. Um, the blue then is, is you know, where, where we would adjust to, and you can see this is where we're renovating A. A you know, stays where it's at now, and, and it's just renovated. Uh, B is, is rebuilt. Uh, we have a new B um, right there to the north. Uh, concourse C is a, is a new Concourse C in the long-term plan. Uh, concourse, uh, existing Concourse C uh, goes away. That's existing Concourse C is that, um, yeah, there you go, Nick, show, show them with the cursor. Yep, with, with the, we call it the, uh, the banjo there. Um, that goes away. Uh, and then new Concourse D eventually replaces that. And then, as Robert mentioned, uh, uh, existing Concourse D to the south goes away and we have new concourse E. Through the chair to, to uh, the, the airport team, to Nick, to all, this is, this is a, this is a, <laughs> so, so substantial a change. It's, uh, this is a very helpful slide. Um, it's discouraging to learn that all of our existing infrastructure is, is uh, so obsolete that it can't be repurposed. Um, but I look forward to revisiting that. And then with, so my final question with that is, um, how, maybe this is a question for our, for our chair, Councilman Slife. Uh, how, how frequently, frequently would we expect that council would receive any briefings? It sounds like the next step is a six month review by the FAA. Uh, so things could change. And the, so what are, what is in a, in a, uh, in a nutshell, what are expectations of council uh, during this process, and we're, when we might when might we expect uh, a next briefing? Thank you, thank you, Council Member Spencer. Um, yeah, it's it's as as exciting as this is. There's no near term legislative needs, obviously, um, that 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 would require you know no an immediate hearing. Uh, I think uh, as I see it, our current uh, obligation as the as the oversight committee is to monitor that FAA approval process and uh, really to act as a conduit uh, between the residents and the airport for this plan uh, just just to help generate generate that interest and understanding uh, so that this can be executed into the future. Uh, my biggest fear is you know if you ever make it up to the uh, city hall attic above planning there's about decades and decades worth of uh, plans that uh, were put out and, and sort of fell by the wayside. And, and I think given the importance of this facility to our region, uh, this is not just a Cleveland thing, this is a, a regional thing, uh, th th there's, there's a real critical need for us to see this through. Uh, so I do anticipate that we will be uh, engaged closely with the airport as this unfolds, uh, but the, as as it was noted, it is a many decades uh, journey between now and now and the end. Uh, I'll let Director Kennedy comment on, on that if he'd like to add in, but I'd also just add one of the things we're dealing with is not necessarily that the facility is, has, is completely obsolete. However, the value of being able to renovate, uh, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, the value of being able to build new and um, uh, it, uh, the, the, the long term cost savings in that over over renovation, it, it gets us a little a little more in um, better able to compete with our peer airports. And I guess what my, my analogy when I was speaking with the director last week is, uh, you know, we're all kind of we're sort of driving like a used Camry at this point and this thing can go forever, but uh, how, how many times are we gonna spend $800 fixing the car? You know, maybe it's at a certain point, maybe it's a good idea to uh, get that new car and have the extended warranty. Uh, but Director Kennedy, is there anything else you'd like to add uh, related to the uh, council member's question? Uh, yes, thank you council person. And to the uh, chair, uh, to the council person, uh, a couple of things. We are reusing 29% uh, of, the, of the old terminal, but as I think it was Dennis that said, part of our terminal, part of our facilities were designed and built when propeller aircraft 
were the dominant aircraft in the, in the air. Uh, and things have changed significantly. You saw the slide on the gate hold areas or the waiting areas. At the time of Concourse D and others, the dominant aircraft size at this airport was a, a 76 seater aircraft. Our average size today is 112, with some carriers running exclusively 220 passenger aircraft into the area. The larger the aircraft, the, the different the apron and the, uh, the gates and all of that to support it, the more bathrooms you need, the less walking distance you wanna have for, for your guests out there. So we are using 20, reusing 29% of the building, but let's face it, older buildings uh, need significantly more maintenance money. I think proper updates to, uh, to uh, um, uh, council would be as things develop, as we get comments back from the FAA and see uh, what they say. As we get comments, um, as we start to look at the, the, the returning traffic level. I, I said earlier when I talked about the loss of jobs, which I, I feel for every one of those jobs we lost, the people that don't have those incomes and so forth, I want to report to council how we're tracking towards that. Because the more guests that we have, the more passengers, the more flights, the more jobs we'll have. And we will have the more need to provide for those planning activity levels. Remember in 2019, the numbers we saw in 2019, we were already behind the planning curve to accommodate those in a good level of service. That's why you saw congestion in our ticketing counter that's why you saw congestion and wait times in our security. That's why you saw significant traffic delays on our roadway system. We even had accidents on 237 and transitioning from 237 onto the airport. On some days, it would back up to Brook Park. And I know Councilman Casey and myself have had many discussions about uh, that type of traffic here. So I think regular, as things develop, as we push forward, as we see those planning activity levels rise, uh, we should be briefing you. That should be a requirement of this office. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you. Uh, moving on, uh, next on my list was uh, Councilman Conwell. Uh, looking at his video, he may have stepped away for a second. So I'll give him a quick moment to see if he's there. Uh, let's move, go, go ahead and move over to uh, Councilwoman Santana and we can circle back with Councilman Conwell. Thank you, Chair Slife. You're doing a wonderful job chairing the uh, committee. So um, <laughs> thanks for the presentation. Very helpful information as Councilwoman Slife, uh, Spencer stated, it, it's complex, a lot of information. So I, I have, my questions are more so about the input that was gathered for the master plan. I'm just curious to know, did any residents participate in giving their feedback on the facility and how was this outreach handled through the chair? Through the chair to the council person. We, uh, we had dozens of meetings, virtual meetings, of course. Uh, we interviewed uh, just about every company on here and we had hundreds of input from the, from the communities. Uh, the, the website, the uh, clevelandmasterplan.com uh, website offers the opportunity for people to, uh, uh, to send in comments. I can tell you we have a very active and engaged uh, citizens here, and I love it. I have uh, uh, Deborah Dixon is, is a person who sends me an email when she travels through the airport or thinks about and says, you know, have you thought about? And, uh, and I'll give her an update of where we are. And that's what we need. And, and it's not only our airlines, it's not only our fuelers and, and our, uh, uh, our team here. Think, I mean, this airport serves our guests. Mm -hmm. Doesn't serve me. I mean, every once in a while I do fly, but it serves our, those millions of people we will never meet. So we need to make it the best. Now, I'm gonna tell you why we call this a preferred alternative. It is called a preferred alternative because no master plan in the history of master plans at airports that I know of, there has been 100% agreement. So you come to consensus. And then a lot of things that, are, um, that uh, people want to see, 
um, you know, what, uh, will you have uh, moving sidewalks and more escalators and uh, more restrooms? And so that comes at our next stage after financing as we do design. And that will be a lot of public input, a lot of user input. We may do uh, focus groups uh, where we just say, okay, you're now at the airport, experience it, and please give us your feedback when you're, when you're done. So that is really the biggest, but we have had hundreds of inputs through uh, individuals and through our website. Yeah. Um, and thank you, Director Kennedy. And I'm actually working on a master plan. And it's been very difficult to obtain input from residents. You know, not everyone likes the Zoom or going online to to um, to give their input. So um, thanks for you know that answer. And how could we help? When is the deadline to to give your input as far as facility or businesses that we want to see? Um, I want to see a direct flight to Puerto Rico. <laughs> We don't have that. I don't know. And you know what? You just even on that point, you know, why can't we have a direct flight to Puerto Rico through the chair to Director Kennedy? Uh, that's an excellent question. It is all about the market and um, how to support the economics of a flight. We know the data that we uh, that uh, people who purchase tickets, where they leave from and where they go. We know that we get it. And then what we have to use, and uh, John Hogan, who is our air service development person, is, is on part of the team here. Uh, then we try to marry that up with capabilities among the airlines, uh, whether it's a JetBlue or a Delta or a United, whoever it is. They have a corporate strategy on how they want to serve the marketplace in Cleveland. So we try to match that up and we try to persuade them. We offer some incentives, the local business uh, community offers incentives uh, to get that. But it all comes down to the financial aspect of, uh, of the market to market connection. I've done this, uh, that part of uh, air service development for a long time around, and that's where it ends. Dollars a cent and how well it can be maintained. Incentives only last so long. It has got to be the strength of the marketplace. So if you and I can work on more people from Puerto Rico coming here and more people from here going to Puerto Rico, our number will get up and uh, we'll have a better story to tell at uh, with the airlines. Yeah. And through the chair to Director Kennedy, do you have data on that now of how many families are traveling to Puerto Rico and vice versa? Is that something that's readily available or we would have to start working on that? through the chair to the council person, uh, we can get that data rather easily. Uh, we subscribe to a number of databases, including DOT and, and um, other, other sources. We compile it. Um, and uh, if you don't mind, uh, Mr. Hogan, uh, John, can you kind of make a comment on this about Puerto Rico particularly? Well, I good, afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Director, and uh, uh, to the uh, committee chair, to the council person. Uh, yes, uh, we have looked at Puerto Rico on a regular basis. Uh, I have gotten that question probably a number of times, uh, especially uh, people that are from Puerto Rico, people like to visit Puerto Rico. Un unfortunately, the numbers just aren't there as of yet. Uh, we continue to work on our markets and try, as the director stated, to uh, improve the, uh, the traffic going back and forth. And uh, if you're looking at a 200 passenger aircraft going daily or 150 passenger aircraft going daily, uh, you would need, as the director stated, you know, number of people coming and going. And uh, we're just not there yet, but we will continue to focus on, on, on that market because I do get that question almost uh, on a daily basis. Thank you, Mr. Hogan. Yeah, my mom just flew there. She had a three hour overlay and she's 78. So it was very tough on her body. But, um, you know, I'm just kind of finished with this. You know, we know that community input just makes a, a plan very successful and a well thought out plan. So let us know how we could help in sharing the survey um, with our residents to give input on, it, especially more of the facility um, and, and the look of the facility. And we just want to help with that. And I, you know, also council members to also give the input. So I want to thank you for this time. Thank you for the information provided and all the great work. Thank, Thank you. you.
Thank you, uh, Council Member Santana. I am uh, personally willing to go on a vacation to San Juan solely to boost the numbers so we can get that flight to Puerto Rico. So uh, <laughs> I'll take one for the team. Um, with that, uh, I know I, I see Councilman Conwell's hand is no longer up. Is there anyone else who has questions uh, for on this presentation or for the good of the order uh, before we adjourn? Uh, Councilman Slyth, I would just like to add uh, a footnote, uh, and, it, and it, it goes back to Councilperson Spencer about the pliability of what, uh, what the plan must be. Um, we talked about the numbers that we had, the guests we were had in 2019. It was the best year in about a dozen years. We were headed on a projection uh, that was really very good compared to our pure set airports. And then 2019 hit, I mean, 2020 hit with COVID. And I will say for the team, for the people out here at the airport, uh, it was hell. It was hell in a lot of our communities, our industry, the travel and, uh, and tourism industry. And for us, particularly here at Cleveland Hopkins, it was on top of a previous year of where we had an IT disaster uh, that impacted us and we were still trying to recover with that when COVID hit. And there was no playbook uh, for COVID. Uh, and, uh, you know, we had employees and people here at the airport that um, they not only had employment worries and concerns, uh, but they also had health concerns. And so there was no playbook, no data to help us. Uh, we didn't know how deep, how wide, how long this was going to be. And we had to take a lot of measures at a lot of companies out here to make sure that we saw it. And I, I got to tell you, quite frankly, I've been through all the things I talked about earlier. There were things on the table that we considered, we looked at, that I would have never considered in the past to make sure that we would just survive. And uh, some of that stuff that the uh, decisions I made and the team made, um, we, uh, we hope to reverse next year when we come to you guys for the budget. I, I promise you, we were just trying to keep our head above water. It was, we were doing monthly calls with our air carriers to make sure they understood what we were doing here in Cleveland and also to prepare them for the recovery. We know there would be a recovery. And we were having these monthly calls for the carriers. And I, gotta, I, use, I wanna use this quote, I've used this quote before, our air carriers, our corporate air carriers, People said the airport has done a great job. Cleveland is an industry leader through this mess that we were going through. We had weekly calls with our employees, uh, given the latest information that we had. Uh, you know, it's kind of hard to talk about strategy and master plan uh, and a future and vision and all of that when you're just trying to make it day to day. And I'm very proud of this team. And, uh, you know, this brighter future that we talk about, uh, it's going to be next year when you see our budget. I've got to restore things that we, we had to take away, uh, investing in our people and opportunity and development, because our challenges will not get easier. Our challenges are going to get harder. Uh, the competition is going to be harder. Uh, we're going to use the resources of City Hall, Director West and her team to help us in our endeavors to, to make it a better place here. So a lot of things will be changing near term that were related to the master plan and our brighter future, but not directly, not so directly, but a good, informed, talented, trained, skilled workforce must be at that back. And as I said about this being a wish uh, for the master plan if we're not inclusive of all areas of our, of our city. I mean that, I believe that, and I've seen the strength of that as I've worked around the airport. So I just want to say, you're going to see other things about budget, about other activities that we're doing. And yes, they are related to our brighter future, but it may be not so overt in what we're going to do. So I appreciate your time, council person. I appreciate the committee's time. And if anyone has any question, our team stands ready day, night, weekends, holidays to help you because this is helping the millions of people we serve. And I thank you.
thank thank you director and uh your your leadership and and the hard work of the team is uh very commendable uh not a year that we're looking to repeat but uh it, the, con congratulations on all you've done uh to get through it and, and we're excited about that future uh council member did you have something to add you know, Mr. Chair, I, I know that we've had a lengthy hearing this morning and that uh, everyone here is very, very important work to do. I uh, did appreciate the footnote from the director. And you know what, I'm just going to share a brief footnote of my own. Um, so long as I'm a member of this committee, I'm going to be uh, this in growth mode and learning mode on all, all of these matters. I just wanted to state that I, I most certainly recognize the regional importance of the airport, its critical importance to economic development and to our region's growth. Um, that said, I started this morning with um, reading about, uh, I think it's the Ford F-150 pickup trucks conversion to potentially being an elect elect electric vehicle. And um, uh, read frequently about climate change and its implications. So I know that seems out of left field, but I just wanted to put that out there that as, as important as it is to talk about growth and passenger uh, numbers increasing and so on, I, I think uh, as a committee member over time, I would, be, I would be very much interested in a conversation about um, is the industry looking at any of those questions? Because I think um, we have to balance our needs for growth with um, how this fits into the bigger picture. I know that's kind of out of nowhere, but I literally started my morning reading about the Ford F-150 pickup and kind of prompting those questions. And I can't wait to get back on an airplane. I haven't been on one in a couple years and I'm really looking forward to it. But um, I think as a passenger and now as a member of Cleveland City Council, just would be interested in knowing and certainly doesn't have to be answered today. I think we have to couple growth with an awareness of um, the way, the direction in which the industry is going as it relates to um, how we get these, these planes off the ground. So um, in terms of the energy usage. So that was my footnote. So <laughs> thanks for indulging me on that. So uh, council person slide, if you could, one more second, if you don't mind. Uh, part of the master plan, a whole section of the master plan is devoted to environmental impact in the environmental. We have a very active uh, environmental team here. We have green roofs. We look at the uh, alternative energy. We're installing some charging stations. Uh, Councilman Slife and I quite often have about how we can get more people on RTA. It is, this was the first airport with direct train connection to downtown. And we have that jewel right into the terminal. We don't have so many. so. Councilperson Spencer, I applaud that. And yes, there are a lot of things good that are on the horizon and being planned into this master plan. Thank you, Councilperson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and in addition to uh, the refined copies of the slides, um, could we also, it, it, are we able to receive a full version of the master plan? Is that is that in full form and ready for release? And if not, can we receive that as soon as it is available? It would be good for uh, to have that document and for the council members to be able to uh, read read those details that you know weren't able to make it into the presentation. So, um, to the council chair, uh, uh, council person, um, um, the master plan needs to go to FAA and get comments back before it's an official. Uh, and it'll be between 600 and 800 pages with diagrams and layouts and so forth. Um, we will um, give, uh, uh, I'll work with the team about what we can do to, to give you that gives you a lot more detail. Uh, it's uh, not that I don't want to give it to you, but the, the book I'm looking at over there is, is probably four inches thick. Uh, that will be presented to uh, FAA. So we'll, we'll work on that. We'll get the, this presentation to you in better form uh, and uh, I'll work on it with the team, sir. Thank, thank you for that. And, um, and, and, and with that, uh, seeing no other hands, uh, this meeting of the Transportation Committee stands adjourned. Thank you everyone today for your participation and to uh, the airport for uh, all the hard work that's gone behind this. Thank you all. Have a good day.